morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are on this planet, due to the non-flatness of our planet. So I'm Frank Marchis. I'm a senior researcher at the Carl Sagan Center and the host of this Hangout. So the reason for which we're doing this Hangout is to share with you the excitement of discoveries made recently by SETI researcher. And today we will discuss uh, what happened last week, in fact, uh, in the study of exoplanet. So I have with me la crème de la crème, the top researcher in exoplanet study. Uh, first of all, close to me, I have John Jenskins. Hi, John. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, John is a senior researcher at the Carl Sagan Center and also the leader of the Kepler analysis team, which is located at NASA Ames. Uh, remotely, we have uh, Paul Callas. Hi, Paul. Hi, Frank. Paul is most likely right now at his office at UC Berkeley. Uh, Paul is an adjunct professor at the University of California at UC Ber at Berkeley, and also a researcher at the Carl Sagan Center of the SETI Institute. And finally, to lead this discussion, uh, we have Adam Mann, space Hi. and physics reporter at White Magazine. Hi, Hi Adam. Hi there. Yes, perfect. And I would just remind my, our viewer that if they want to ask any specific questions to us, uh, they can send it on our Facebook, Google page, or on Twitter as well with the hashtag uh, SETI Hangout. And I wish we will start with the first question coming from uh, Adam. It's your turn. Sure. Well, I think uh, just to start off with and, and set the uh, tone here, there was a, a big astrophysics conference last week, and I believe I was told that about 30% of the talks and, and research that was presented were about exoplanets, which shows you how vibrant this field is. So uh, maybe, John, could you give us a little bit of, a, of an overview of what has recently come out of the Kepler catalog uh, regarding exoplanets? Sure. Well, thank you, Adam. Uh, last week was a very exciting time at the American Astronomical Society meeting that was held in Long Beach. And indeed, it seemed like uh, it was exoplanets all the time throughout the entire meeting. So I, I feel sorry for those poor cosmologists that were off the by themselves. But uh, it seems to be the, the time for exoplanets uh, at, the, at the moment. And there were a number of very exciting talks. And what I can uh, reprise for you today in a few minutes is the, uh, the slides that we presented at a press conference where we announced the um, addition of 461 new Kepler planet candidates. And so, uh, Frank, are you sharing that? At the yes. Episode? Okay, so if everybody can see it. that. Uh, this was presented by another SETI Institute scientist on behalf of the entire Kepler team, which uh, constitutes um, a wide range of, of scientists across uh, the country and indeed several in Europe. So it's a very big team. Uh, SETI Institute is very proud to participate in this mission and have the honor of presenting these results. They rate on slide two. Um, yes. Well, we want to tell you first that the, the whole point of Kepler is to determine what fraction of stars in our galaxy harbor potentially habitable Earth-sized planets. That's why we launched this mission back in 2009, and it's the, the quest that we continue on today. If we go to the next slide, I'd like to put the new discoveries into context by talking about the history of our, our candidate catalog. So as of two years ago, in February of 2011, we had announced a total of 1,235 candidates. And um, Could you tell us what candidates mean compared to real planet? Yes, I can. And that is that um, it's a Kepler planetary candidate is an object that we've identified in the Kepler data that gives all indications of being a planetary body, but for which we have yet to assemble a sufficient amount of follow-up observations or analysis work to directly confirm or validate as a planet. So at the moment, we have a little over 100 planets that we've announced as confirmed or validated planets, but the docket is much fuller with the candidates that we've observed. And uh, that's just the funny thing about this business. It's, it's far easier to identify candidates than it is to actually confirm and follow up uh, the individuals. Um, so but, far, John, uh, about how many, how many candidates have turned out to be actual planets? What's the percentage? Well, at the moment, we have a little over 100 planets that are confirmed or validated. And we have a, a total of approximately 2,700 candidates. So that tells you 
um, in some sense, how big the job is to go from a planet candidate to a confirmed or validated planet. However, we've been studying, and other people have been studying our false positive rate, and one of the most interesting papers that was given at this meeting was given by a Kepler team member, Francois Fresen, who studied our false alarm rate and believes it to be between 10 and 20 percent. So the planetary candidates that we're announcing is is a relatively pure sample. It's it's got a very high reliability. Because there is at least three detections, right? For to be a candidate, you have to have you have to be detected. The transit has to be detected three times at least. Well, the typical candidate will have at least three transits. There are some candidates that have two or perhaps one transit, but those are events with very high signal to noise ratio, and so you can learn much more or make decisions based on the detailed shape of the light curve and how well it matches a planetary template. But those form, uh, there are only a handful of those cases. But going forward, all of the new candidates require at least three transits. So uh, that's why Kepler Planet Candidate uh, catalogs are of such interest to the community because uh, what we're seeing now are the first, I think, genuine attempts to um, map out the intrinsic frequency of planets based on robust statistics from the Kepler sample. And we haven't seen this heretofore. People have tried it before, but the analyses were um, relied on um, a much smaller data set, and we didn't know enough about or nearly as much as we do now about the completeness of our, of our sample. So it was very exciting to see at least three different groups looking at our data from different vantage points and different angles coming up with basically the same answer. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So because well. the, the Kepler data, mm -hmm. after being taken by the spacecraft, you process them. That's your, that's your role, in fact. And that's then right. you make them available to your community. Everybody can access to the, to the Kepler data. That's right. And in fact, um, we're in the extended mission now, so we're just beyond our primary mission of three and a half years. And on January 7th, we made available to the public and to the community all of the diagnostics and, and products of our pipeline related to the new catalog objects. And indeed, all the, all the objects that we have in, our, in all the catalogs to date that we have that diagnostic information for. So previously, that information was held within the team for, for us to use uh, to dis make our dispositions of the candidates as, as either planet candidates to assess and prioritize them for follow-up or, or to decree them to be false positives for reasons that we found in the data or in follow-up observations. So it's a brand new resource at the Exoplanet Archive that's um, down at Caltech and it's open to anyone. So there are some very exciting candidates in this sample including a super-Earth in the habitable zone of a, of a sun-like star. And What's the name of this one? Uh, that's KOI, Kepler Object of Interest. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, that's sort of like our first uh, designation as something that might be a planet. is a Kepler Object of Interest um, 172. And uh, in, in the recent run of the pipeline, we identified a second planetary-like signature. And it, it, if it proves to be a planet, it would be about 1.5 Earth radii um, in a 242 day period orbit about this star. And um, it would be have an equilibrium temperature we estimate of about 280 degrees. So it's a little bit on the warm side for a habitable zone, but uh, we're definitely moving down the line, down the field towards our ultimate goal of finding an Earth analog system. So that's a very exciting system, and all of our diagnostic products are available at the Exoplanet Archive for people to to go through and, and look at our candidates. Um, now, in the year after, uh, year after February 1st, 2011, we released our, our, our third major catalog, and that brought us up to a total of uh, 2,321 Kepler objects of interest. And you see that with the red dots, we're pushing down with respect to the size of the planet. So the horizontal lines uh, are marked Earth, Neptune, and Jupiter, Jupiter and that rep represents the, the radius of Earth, Neptune, and Jupiter for comparison against these candidates. And then the orbital period is, is on the bottom, or x-axis. You see that in general we're moving down to smaller candidates. We're also moving out to longer orbital periods. That's of great interest for habitability because the short orbital periods are for planet, the planets are, are too close to their star to permit liquid water to pool on the surface. They're just too hot. So as we move out in orbital period, then we get to cooler regimes where eventually you find 
uh, places where liquid water could pool on the surface and, and, and you have the chance to be habitable. Um, so this new catalog essentially brings us to a total of 2,740 candidates. Um, it's interesting in that this catalog only added six months of data onto the previous can uh, candidate catalog, which was based on 16 months of data, but we were able to add um, over 400 new candidates based on only a small amount of data. So why this? Because you have a better pipeline? Because you understand better the instrument? Or because Well, all of the above. So we have a, we have a, a better understanding of the instrument, a better understanding of, <clears throat> of the stars and how they behave, and are better able to tease out the signatures of what the stars are saying versus what the instrument is doing. So it's all gotten better. Uh, it's also true that that as at this moment we have analyzed the first 12 quarters worth of data, so the first three years of data, but we haven't had time to go through and vet the interesting objects in, in that list. And we have over 18,000 planetary-like signatures um, that we've identified. All of those are also available on the Exoplanet Archive. Most of those are going to turn out to be false positives, and this is where the the vetting of, of the what we call threshold crossing events, which is something that so the pipeline looks like a planet-like signature, but uh, in most cases it actually proves to be a glitch or an instrumental artifact. And so one requires great care in, in going through those, uh, those threshold crossing events to identify new candidates. And one of the things I probably won't have time to talk about today is the fact that, that my team and I are working on a machine learning approach to vetting the diagnostics coming out of the pipeline. So instead of taking six months, to go from a pipeline run where you have, say, 12,000, or in this case, 18,000 potential transit-like signatures to get to a new catalog and a new paper on that catalog, um, uh, we should be able to run the pipeline and then run this auto-vetter right afterwards and then have a ranked prioritized list from the most credible to the least credible that we can post immediately. Okay. That will help improve people's ability to identify interesting objects that they can go and then point their telescope on and conduct follow-up observations or hopefully it'll assist people in doing population studies and statistics more rapidly um, while we play catch up with uh, the humans using their eyes and their judgment. So that's a very interesting um, and very challenging task. Um, so I'd like to focus on um, some, of the, some of the new things in this, in this uh, new catalog. And one of the most striking things we saw was that the growth in terms of the numbers of candidates grew the most for the earth size and super earth size candidates. We saw much less growth in terms of the numbers of the, the Neptune and larger size candidates. Um, we also increased the number of stars that host more than one planetary candidate, and we have new candidates in the habitable zone. So if we go to the next slide, we see here's the histogram, and it shows the relative increases among the five different categories here. And we see that the small planets less than 1.25 Earth radius grew the most by almost 43%, which tells you that we're really doing a much better job with our pipeline in terms of teasing out this, these very weak signatures and being able to distinguish between the planet signatures and instrumental effects. Um, uh, you might notice that we also saw a small decrease in the Jupiter size objects, and that's due to the fact that as we accumulate more information about the field of view and about the stars, um, we're also doing a better job of finding our own false positives that made it through the first, the first time. And so we see a, a small decrease in the Jupiter-sized objects because some of those indeed proved to be uh, false positives and we've removed them from the list. It's interesting that in terms of false positives, the Jupiter and larger size planet candidates have a higher false positive rate than the Neptune and super-Earths. And then it rises back up a little bit for the smallest objects simply because you don't have as much signal there to uh, look at. Um, so uh, I'll put I, this next slide. Up. Oh, do you have a question? No, I don't. Do you have a question? Uh, I guess I was just wondering, can you tell us a little bit about what we're learning about these other systems and, and just how alien they are compared to our system? You know, what's the difference between our solar system and, and these other uh, planets we're finding? Uh, I think we'll get to that on, on just a few more slides, but uh, we're finding a lot of multiple planet systems. So on this slide that uh, Frank's showing right now, you can see that the growth in the number of, 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 of planets that we have in these multiple candidate systems. And so we have now over 1,500 single planet candidate systems, 
but we have almost 300 double planet candidates, and we've increased uh, across the board except for uh, Kepler 11, which still holds the record as having the most planetary candidates. Well, in that case, they're all confirmed, um, have six planets. Um, but we're seeing growth in that now because we've only been looking at, in this case, uh, 22 months of data, so just shy of two years, uh, we're not talking about uh, planetary systems as large as ours in terms of orbital periods. So the biggest difference in some sense is that these are much more compact than the solar system. Kepler-11, for example, if you compared it to the solar system, all six planets in that system would be within the orbit of Venus. And in fact, the five innermost planets, would, their orbits would all lie within the orbit of Mercury. But the commonality we're finding among these multiple planetary systems is that they all appear to be very flat, much like our own solar system. So Kepler-11, for example, if you shrunk it down to the size of a, a compact disk, the orbits of the planets would all stay within the vinyl, within the plastic. It's that flat. So, um, if, so what we're finding from Kepler is that multiple planet systems appear to be very common, and those planetary systems tend to be very coplanar. Otherwise, we won't see as many of them mm -hmm. as, as we do. So that's, yeah, that's very interesting. That's the detection technique. Right, and those multiple candidate systems then afford the opportunity to look for gravitational interactions between the planets. That allows us to confirm a large number of planets because one planet can be tugging on another and, and getting sort of drafting like you do on bicycles in a race and speeding up so that the transits, rather than being occurring with a strict periodicity, some come a little bit sooner than you expect and then some come a little bit later. And you can then model that and work out, in, in some instances, the masses of the planets which for some of these systems, because they're so dim, you could never hope to do with radio velocity, at least not with today's instrumentation and telescopes. Um, so this next slide shows you equilibrium temperature on the x-axis, and this gives you a direct comparison in some, some sense with our own solar system and where the Earth is. So our Earth is there in a cartoon at uh, one Earth radius, the line there, at uh, 255 degrees Kelvin, and that's where we hope to find many of our candidates. And as you can see, we're starting to fill in that green lane that contains potentially habitable worlds. They're at a distance for which liquid water might be expected to pull on the surface. But whether or not that happens depends on whether there's water there and also depends on the makeup and composition of the atmosphere and how massive the planet is. Yeah, um, so to clarify, it's not because a planet is on this habitable zone that you would have liquid water. Because right. the, the, the composition of the atmosphere is as important as the distance to the to the star. That's right. Uh, so we define this habitable zone in such a way so that if the planet had an Earth-like composition for its atmosphere, you would expect if there were water there, it would pull on the surface. So for instance, if you assume that it has a Venus-like composition or a Mars-like composition, you're going to shift this habitable zone significantly. You might, but you know, initially Venus Earth started out very much alike in terms of their the bulk materials that were there, but if you took Venus today and moved it to Earth's orbit, it would not become habitable because it's lost all its water, mm -hmm. lost all of its water very early on. So, um, at any rate, this is showing the progress we're making, and indeed, uh, if we zoom in, let's go, let's see, let's go to the most interesting slide, I believe it's slide 11. So, four of our new candidates are, are small, um, within about uh, less than twice Earth radius, um, are in the habitable zone. And you might note that the number of candidates we have in the Hubble zone hasn't changed between this catalog and the last catalog. There's a very interesting story there, but basically we haven't lost those planets that were previously in the Hubble zone that are not. They've been replaced by new ones. What happened was our knowledge of the properties of the stars has changed. And so some of those planets' stars actually turned out to be a little bit hotter and a little bit bigger than we thought based on the information that we... That we uh, Put together before we launched, okay. and so uh, that moved those planets out of the habitable zone. But some planets moved in, and then these are new candidates. So this slide summarizes in four dots the main discovery of, uh, of with the Kepler data. <laughs> Basically, well, it is four. Um, in some dots. sense, if we go to the next slide, uh, these are in some sense these are potentially the most <laughs> interesting candidates of the new ones uh, that we've added. And the arrow shows you the position of KOI 17202, which is this potentially habitable super Earth. So that's a 1.5 radius. 
uh, Earth's planet, exoplanet. Right. Also. Now that, that radius has a large uncertainty, and we're working, actually, um, there. I'm, in fact, I know that there are several teams working to try to um, characterize the system, and uh, there's a large slop or, or you know, room for the final planet radius to move to, depending on how well we understand the stellar properties. But according to our current adopted stellar parameters, this is where it sits. Adam, do you have a question about this? Can you uh, maybe paint us, a, uh, try and be, I guess, more speculative and uh, paint us a picture of what this, what would it look like to see a planet that's actually one and a half times bigger than Earth? Would it look significantly different than our own? Uh, that's a really good question. And in fact, this is something that's become a much bigger question than before we launched Kepler. Before we launched Kepler, we assumed that any planet that was less than about twice the size of Earth by radius would be rocky, because we assumed um, some of those, the large ones would be failed Jupiter cores of five or so Earth masses, um, five to ten Earth masses. But we didn't know about super-Earths, these potential water worlds or ice worlds or mini Neptunes. So um, uh, the speculation you're asking for actually is, has to grow wilder, because we don't know exactly where, the, uh, where you see the distinction between um, a mini Neptune or a planet with perhaps a significant rocky core, but a large um, volatile envelope with a lot of hydrogen in it, in it, and something that you would call a super-Earth that would be super-Earth-like in terms of having a rocky surface and an, and an atmosphere composition similar to our own. Um, so in this case, because of the uncertainty on the parameters of the star, I would expect the radius to inflate a little bit, to go up, in which case I would say this is probably more like a, a, a a mini Neptune, or perhaps perhaps one of these volatile, rich, rocky worlds that has still retained a significant amount of hydrogen and helium on it. So, do we know the age of the star for this one, for instance? Um, I, you know, I don't know that off the top of my head. I think that it's really preliminary for us to say anything about that. But the unfortunate thing about this particular star is that uh, it's very dim, so I don't think that we'll be able to do asteroseismology on it. That's where we look for acoustic oscillations in the star that we can actually measure with Kepler. And, and through the information we get from those observations, we can then uh, estimate the age of the star. But this star is almost, it's I think, 14.7 magnitudes, which is very dim. Oh, yeah. So um, that means that kinds of and it's a system which is far than uh, in terms of light year or something like that. Uh, it might be something like, I think it's farther than that. I think it's on the order of 2,000, 2,700 light years, something like that. So, yeah, it's a, I think it's a late, it's a late G star, like a G8 or something. So, so it's that's a little bit smaller than the sun. Like, sun like smaller than the sun, so it's not quite as far as a, as a sun twin would be, but it's still pretty far out there. Okay. So that's basically it, but I, I do want to wrap up by uh, summarizing Francois Fresen's talk and, and just give you the, sort of like the, the bang boxes and, and, or headlines, and that is that uh, Francois did an analysis of our statistics, and the big results were that basically 17% or one in six main sequence stars has an Earth-sized planet orbiting it. Uh, uh, moreover, if you look at, and, and that's, that's at least, because he's only looking at orbital periods out to 85 days, so just inside the orbit of Mercury, when you think about it that way. And for periods out to 85 days, 70% uh, of stars have at least one planet of any size. So those two things taken together indicate that Earth-sized planets are extremely prevalent throughout the galaxy, and that if you look at this from the perspective of, while well, you're only looking out to 85 days, surely there must be many more planets at orbital periods beyond that, then you should effectively round up 70% to say that every main sequence star should be expected to have at least one planet of some size. And that was the goal of Kepler, to provide statistical uh, measurement of the, the amount of planets in, in the in our galaxy, right? That That's was right. That's the main reason for which we we launched uh, Kepler. This, that, that was the, the That's main question. That's exactly right. Now what we want to do in the extended mission is move the goalpost out to 365 days in orbital period for sun-like stars so that we get a direct measurement of the frequency of Earth-sized planets in or near the habitable zone of sun-like stars. And that requires us to collect more data and to work harder at processing the data. So is it possible? Is it going to be possible to collect more data? 
Well, that's what we're doing today, and we certainly hope that it continues for a very long time. So what's going to limit you? Well, um, the main, there are two main limits, intrinsic limits. One is that we only have so much hydrazine fuel that's necessary for us to manage the momentum of our reaction wheels that we use to control our pointing. And we believe that we have about a total lifetime of about 10 years worth of, of propellant for, for that purpose. Uh, the other main limitation is that we're, Kepler is in a earth trailing orbit similar to Spitzer. And over time, it drifts further and further away from Earth because Earth is on a small orbit. So Earth is going fast around the sun. Um, in fact, we're at about uh, half the distance between us and the sun right now from Kepler. So Kepler is at about one half AU. And so um, those are the two principal limitations now. We have had uh, some problems with our reaction wheels and lost one reaction wheel earlier this year. Uh, we've put in mitigations in terms of how we operate the spacecraft to try to minimize the chance that we would lose an additional reaction wheel. But um, we knew before we launched that there were problems with these reaction wheels, and we uh, were able to make modifications to make them more robust. But we've already lost one, so uh, basically we'll have to wait and see what happens. There's no, there's no guarantee. In this it's cross finger too. Does it work well, if you cross finger? Uh, well, it works just as well as anything else I suppose that we can do sitting here. Uh, okay, cool. Adam, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I think maybe uh, we could talk a little bit to uh, to Paul. We've got him here as okay. well. Um, about another uh, discovery made with a different telescope, um, not the not the great Kepler telescope, but the great Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and maybe, Paul, you could tell us a little bit about uh, what it is that you guys uh, presented at AAS and, and a little bit about the history of, of this object that you guys were looking at. Sure. Uh, I've got my slides. Um, uh, I've sent them over to Frank. Uh, I have them, yes. Let me uh, share the screen again. So uh, I can speak to the slides. There you go. Um, if that's available, that's my. That's the uh, the the first slide. Uh, it's important to note that uh, uh, I work with these uh, great scientists, James Graham, Mike Fitzgerald, and Mark Clampin. Uh, and this result that we presented at the AAS is really a, a milestone in our study of formal hot. Uh, if you go to the next slide. You'll recall that uh, Fomalhaut sort of made headlines about four years ago in 2008 um, because of this beautiful nebulosity, a dust belt around the star that you can clearly see in this image here. But also we discovered uh, a tiny point source to the lower right called Fomalhaut B, which, uh, yeah, around there, uh, you can't see it in this slide, uh, but you'll see it in the next slides. And that, that is the, uh, the object uh, that we think is a planet orbiting the star just inside the dust belt. And, um, and how often do we see like a direct image of a planet like this? These are rare now. The, this is the sort of the, one of the most challenging types of observations because the star is so bright. In the middle there you see sort of a black region We've blocked the star using the coronagraph aboard the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and this is the type of thing you can also do for the sun. You can use a coronagraph and block the sun so you can see the corona. And uh, just for context, the, the Kepler stars are very far from the sun, uh, hundreds of light years away from us. Fomalhaut the star is 25 light years from Earth, and it's a first magnitude star. So you can see it with your naked eye. So the problem is that, it, is that it's so bright, it's very difficult to detect the, the belt that you see here and Fomalhaut B. So it's a, it's a technical challenge that we're, we're just beginning to overcome. Um, and in fact, because of this problem, we can never, at the current time, we can't look for Earth-like planets close to the star. What we're sensitive to are the ice giants or gas giants that are far from the star, analogs to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So this was four years ago. Let's go to the next slide. Um, basically, what happened is as soon as we discovered Fomalhaut B, the instrument, the camera we were using, uh, its electronics failed. And uh, 
so we said, okay, let's wait for the astronauts to go and service the Hubble Space Telescope and fix this particular camera. But after the astronauts went there uh, in 2009, this camera wasn't restored. So our discovery instrument, the Advanced Camera for Surveys chronograph, was no longer available to us so that we could get a third observation. And I understand other people were also trying to look for it as well, right? At this yeah. time? Yes, so uh, we can look for formal hot B from the ground uh, using uh, uh, large telescopes like the Keck telescope or the very large telescope in Chile. Uh, in the infrared, you can use the Spitzer Space Telescope. Uh, and basically, the only telescope that seemed capable of detecting formal hot B is the Hubble Space Telescope at optical wavelengths instead of infrared wavelengths. And this is one of the mysteries of formal hot B. Why is it so bright in the optical at visible wavelengths? So we turned to another uh, instrument aboard Hubble called STIS. And uh, we imaged formal hot B in 2010 and 2012. And that's, these are the data that we presented just now uh, yielding these new discoveries. Here, here is the 2010 image of uh, formal hot B. So you can see the dust belt here. It's a, at a different orientation for, uh, for those amateur astronomers out there. Uh, north is up, east is left. Uh, and that, that inset shows that little speck there, and that is formal hot B, uh, that speck there. Uh, it was puzzling because formal hot B didn't seem to be on the path we expected. We thought formal hot B would orbit inside the ring, sort of nested inside the dust belt that you see. And in this case, we saw it go slightly to the right, too far to the right. But we didn't know if this was uh, real or maybe a problem with the way we understood the data. So let's go to the next slide. And here's our 2012 observation. Uh, we uh, were awarded uh, slightly more Hubble time to do this observation. We have a nicer image of the dust belt. Formal hot B is detected uh, uh, in a very nice way there. You can see how strong the detection is there. And what we confirmed is that, in fact, formal hot B is drifting towards the right so that uh, it will actually cross the dust belt as you see it in projection in basically two decades from now, uh, formal hot B will cross, uh, will appear to cross through the dust belt in 2032. Let's see if the next slide works. There is the 2010, uh, 2004 data. Uh, I guess the animation is not working, possibly because of the way I sent it. But let's see. It's, well, okay, I guess it's not working. Let's, let's go to the next slide. It shows the same thing. So anyway. <laughs> we went too far ahead there. There you go. That really does show the, the, that path, that inset shows 2004, 2006, 2010, and 2012. And if you look at that path there, you can see that, uh, the, that formal hot B is essentially going to pass through the belt uh, sometime in the future, roughly two decades from now. We don't know if it's going to actually penetrate the belt uh, in three-dimensional space, but projected on the sky, formal hot B will appear to cross the belt. Also, if you look at the dust belt itself, I'm pointing out there with that big blue arrow uh, that the, the belt is much wider than we previously thought. Uh, you could fit our entire solar system in, in that region of space uh, pointed out by the arrow. And just north of formal hot B, below that nebulosity, is a gap in the dust belt, which is also a new discovery, which is uh, very exciting. Let's look at the next slide, actually. Here we've sort of stretched the belt in a direction so that it appears as if we're looking at it face on instead of at an angle. And if you can go to the next slide. This is the notional orbit of uh, formal hot B. Uh, formal hot B is circled there. Uh, and uh, what you can see is this orbit is not a circle itself. It's very elliptical. That's why we call it a rogue orbit. In other words, it's uh, uh, 
a very eccentric shape and it's an uh, orbit that passes into and out of the planetary system the every 2000 years in fact is the rough orbital period so every 2000 years Fomalhaut b completes uh, this uh, robe orbit can we go to the next slide please now what we've discovered is that it comes much closer to the star than previously thought so if you look at its uh, closest approach it's 40 astronomical units which is much closer than what we previously thought and then uh, on its outward journey it uh, goes outward to something like 350 astronomical units and that's why we call it a rogue orbit it swings in very close and goes out very far uh, other other extrasolar planets have been detected with uh, with such eccentric orbits by the way so this is not entirely surprising in the field of extrasolar planets but in terms of direct you said other planet has been observed like this they've been observed by transit by radial velocity radial, by radial velocity techniques so these are the types of planets that that for example uh, Kepler can detect very close to their stars so this is the first uh, direct image planet that has such an eccentric orbit and that's why it's such a surprise to the to us and to other scientists uh, can you can you click the next slide uh, there, I've, I've sort of labeled the gap there, that main belt gap, as we call it. Uh, its origin is unknown. Uh, it may be due to uh, planetary perturbations, in fact. So that's something uh, we should uh, stay tuned for, because we, uh, uh, we may have uh, more breakthroughs in understanding what causes that belt gap. So there's a nice video. Th this slide shows a video uh, which is also available on the SETI Institute website. When you look, it's also available on YouTube. Uh, when you look uh, on on our press release material on the SETI Institute website, it's on the right hand side of the uh, of the press release. So let's just skip this. It kind of shows what it what it's like to be on Fomalhaut B and travel through the system every 2,000 years. Let's go to the next slide. This puzzle, there's a, there's a, there's a very interesting puzzle here, and it's why can we detect Fomalhaut B in the optical? Usually we think of planets uh, that are quite young, like Fomalhaut B, as emitting thermal radiation because they're very warm. So that means we should be able to detect these planets in the infrared and Fomalhaut B is, is anomalously bright in the optical. So what we think, uh, as shown in this illustration, is that at the center we have a planet mass object, and it's surrounded by a shroud or a ring of dust. And what we, we can see is reflected light from the circumplanetary dust cloud. And one of the things uh, we're proposing is that the mass of Fomalhaut b has to be at least one and a half times the mass of Ceres, the asteroid Ceres in our solar system, uh, which is actually it's a dwarf planet. Uh, that's its new classification. Because uh, to have this dust bound to a central object, you have to have a certain mass. So the mass of Fomalhaut b has to be at least something like our dwarf planets in our solar system. That's the minimum mass. And the maximum mass, well, like I said, the infrared uh, telescopes have not detected Fomalhaut b, and this suggests that the mass is a Jupiter or less. So essentially, that's the sort of uh, mass range we have for Fomalhaut b, between a dwarf planet and a Jupiter. So when you observe Fomalhaut b with HST, you don't see the planet; you see the cocoon around the yeah, planet. Yeah, we see we see sort of the outer layers, the uh, the dust that uh, is possibly due, for example, to moons around Fomalhaut b. Uh, so uh, if you if you were to take the satellites of Saturn, for example, and start eroding them, you would produce a dust cocoon around Saturn that would be bright enough in reflected light to be seen in the optical. And this is expected considering the age of Fomalhaut, uh, the star itself. It's this is expected. 
so one interesting thing that's different from, for example, the Kepler target stars is that FOMO hot B is less than 500 million years old. Uh, the age is uh, estimated at 450 million years, which means that it's an analog of our early solar system. So if you could, if you could have, go into a time machine uh, here on, in our solar system and, and dial it back four billion years, our solar system would look very, very different from what it looks like now. The solar, the, the, maybe the moon, Earth's moon hasn't formed yet. Uh, there might be extra Mars-sized objects uh, in our vicinity. Uh, there would be asteroids and comets crashing into uh, the terrestrial planets all the time, delivering uh, water and modifying the surfaces and creating their atmospheres. So that's the type of system that Fomalhaut currently is like, uh, sort of like our early solar system. With a gigantic star in the middle. With a gigantic star, Fomalhaut is actually uh, two times the mass of our sun. Uh, so it's 16 times more luminous than our sun. And does that tell us anything about uh, the history of our own solar system? Like, uh, our are you able to gain any insight, I guess? Well, yes, this, is, this slide here actually uh, speaks to that question. Uh, our solar system is still a mystery, even though we live inside of it. Uh, we actually don't have a time machine, and we have to infer the, the history of our solar system uh, using theory and uh, constrained by observations of its present state. So, for example, the Kuiper Belt is a bit of a mystery. Uh, on the lower right here, you can see some of the eccentric orbits of Kuiper Belt objects, such as Sedna uh, and two other objects, and also indicated is the orbit of Neptune. So how, how is it that Sedna has this strange orbit? Uh, uh, it's sort of a, a dwarf planet. Uh, it's detached from our solar system currently. Did it originate from inside our solar system and somehow uh, get scattered out there? Or did it form out there and, uh, and had nothing to do with our planetary system? Uh, you know, the, the planets uh, from Neptune and inward. Uh, so this is a mystery. And what we think is that by studying Fomalhaut and Fomalhaut B, we might get some insights into how planets, dwarf planets, comets, and asteroids, how they evolve and dynamically interact with each other uh, in, their early, uh, in their early history uh, uh, and much later leading to a stable planetary configuration. So that, that work, uh, to answer your question, hasn't been done yet. But this is the potential that Fomalhaut has for illuminating what may have happened in our solar system four billion years ago. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, so the main question is, where is Fomalhaut C? Fomalhaut B, uh, we've discovered, has a very eccentric orbit. How about another planet? How did... We know that planets do not form in eccentric orbits. They have to have a roughly circular orbit. So something happened to Fomalhaut B recently that put it on this very eccentric orbit. One mechanism is that in its lifetime, it met another more massive planet in the system. And that's what I mean by Fomalhaut C. Another more massive planet is lurking inside the dust belt, I mean, within the boundary of the dust belt. Maybe a million years ago or so, Fomalhaut C had a close interaction. I mean, Fomalhaut B and C had a close interaction, and Fomalhaut C got scattered outwards because it's the less massive of the two planets, for example. So, uh, is it possible that uh, in a few years we may find this Fomalhaut C? I think so, uh, because we'll, uh, with more sensitive telescopes uh, and a more dedicated uh, imaging program, we'll become more sensitive to uh, Jupiter mass planets in the system. Cool. So there's still a, a lot left to be learned here and a few more mysteries. Yeah, oh, yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. I think we're wrapping up. Well, here, here are the sort of things we'd like to do. 
In the near term, what we need to do is get a spectrum of FOMO hot B, uh, possibly with a Hubble Space Telescope. That would really tell us if this shroud of dust is the explanation for why FOMO hot B is so optically bright. We also have to keep tracking the orbit uh, year after year because uh, there are some significant unknowns about the orbit. For example, does it really, is it really going to go through the belt? or is it in, in two decades, or is it going to pass just above or just below the belt? If it actually hits the belt, then uh, there's tremendous potential to see phenomena uh, analogous to the Shoemaker-Levy 9 impacts on Jupiter, where, would, where we would see comet-like bodies crashing into a planet. That would be uh, remarkable to observe in, a, in an extrasolar planetary system. So these are some of the things that uh, we're looking forward to. And uh, my la the next slide is, uh, is sort of the last slide. Uh, uh, we don't know everything about the FOMO hot system. And every time we uh, get some uh, new data, it's uh, uh, providing these uh, surprises and these links to our own planetary system. Awesome. I'm sure there's um, a lot of questions I could ask. But uh, Frank, do we have any questions from? From Twitter or from uh, the general audience? Uh, yes, we have a question. We have some questions. Let's see. Uh, I have one question for Paul. Yes. He, he knows why I'm asking this question. Paul, you um, there was this huge debate about the existence of Homa OB and whether or not this is a planet or an artifact. So yes. now, can you tell us that you're 100% sure that this is a planet? Should we put this one in our uh, calendar as a real planet? Yes, it's a hundred. Well, let me just say that. Uh, let me just tell you the the facts. We've observed, we've detected FOMO hot B four times with the Hubble Space Telescope, and three independent groups, uh, us included, but there are two other groups independently from us, downloaded the data and confirmed the existence of FOMO hot B. So those are the those are facts. Uh, so you can say, I think, in my opinion that the consensus view is FOMO hot B is real. Anybody who says it's not real would have to argue against the data and against the, the, the groups, the three independent groups who have analyzed the data. OK, thank you. So we have some questions coming from Twitter, Facebook, Google. And one of them is a question by James Schumacher. Um, I think that's for you. And the question is, uh, Kepler had discovered Earth-sized planets but mostly in close orbit. Will this change as more data comes in? Well, undoubtedly it, it will, and it already has. That we're as we analyze longer data sets, then that extends the orbital periods in which we can find planets. So, with three years worth of data, you can um, see periods out to about a year, and uh, and so we're we're just about at that point right now. So again, there are eighteen thousand. 406 uh, threshold crossing events that represent, the, in some sense, the initial stages of, of our planetary formation process in terms of forming planetary candidates. And so people can go out and look at that stuff. But yes, indeed, as we collect more data, we can look out to longer period orbits. Do you have any questions for Paul on the? Yeah, so the one question. Oh, no, actually not for Paul. I think this is just a general question. Given the probability. Given the probably huge number of exoplanets in our galaxy, do you think there's a significant chance you will find extraterrestrial intelligence in the next 50 years? I think that's just open to everybody. That's a, that's a difficult <laughs> question. That's, that's, that's a really good question. 50 years. 50 years. We get, well, give I, you 50 years. I hope, I, I hope the answer is yes, because I might have some chance of being alive when okay. it happens. But, um, but uh, what do you think we need to, to, to do that? What's going to be the price? And this is a question for Paul, too. If you, if you really want to find an exoplanet with life on it, what do we need? Well, if we're talking about uh, detection of um, through, say, uh, spectroscopy, where you actually are analyzing light reflected off the planet's atmosphere to understand whether there's ozone and methane and other biomarkers. Bio, bio, bio biomarkers. Biomarkers. Um, I think we will eventually do that, but um, 
there are two things, there are some things working against us and some things working for us. So we know with some of the more recent discoveries um, that, and, and the results, statistical results out of Kepler that, that planets appear to be very prevalent. So almost any star you look at will have, have planets in relatively close orbits. But when you're, you're talking about Earth-sized planets, uh, then uh, even the projected technology that hasn't been built yet that we think is, is within reach um, is going to be very expensive and can only reach out to um, the nearest stars. So while I think it's going to happen, I'm not sure it's going to happen within 50 years just because it's going to take so much in terms of resources. Now, of course, we could get the answer through SETI, through the direct detection of extraterrestrial radio signals or optical signals, and I guess that's sort of um, the shortcut that we're all hoping will come through. But in terms of direct imaging and spectroscopy, that's something for Earth-like planets in the habitable zone that is is is, I think, going to happen eventually, but I, I wouldn't be willing to bet that it would happen within 50 years. Paul, you have uh, something to add to this? Well, yeah, uh, I think actually the work John uh, Jenkins and the Kepler scientists are, are really uh, a critical link to to uh, to getting to detecting intelligent life uh, because before uh, before uh, this work. Uh, we didn't know which stars to target uh, with radio telescopes and the SETI searches. Uh, but now the Kepler, uh, the Kepler work is telling us which stars are in a, have an Earth-like planet in a habitable zone. So we know that's, that those are the stars we should spend time uh, looking at uh, for SETI signals. So uh, uh, it's a tremendous advance, I think. Fomalhaut B and, and the planets we directly image, they're too young uh, to have formed intelligent life, or any life, I would say. As I was, as, as I was indicating, uh, it's like looking at our solar system four billion years ago. So uh, it's this Kepler work that is really critical to, to getting at this uh, problem. Well, what I would say is interesting because let's Kepler is looking at one area of the sky accurately and detect exoplanets. You, Paul, are, you are looking for very close stars and bright to be able to see exoplanets. What, what would be great is to have a Kepler for bright stars. Have a Kepler which is capable of observing bright star, nearby star, to detect transit of this nearby star. And this way we would be able to find uh, exoplanet, Earth-like planet, and with new technology we'll be able to image this exoplanet as well. I mean, I'm talking about uh, having 30 meter class telescope on the ground, or having also <laughs> space, uh, bigger space telescopes. Okay, so what would, ideally it would be great to merge the two projects somehow, and I think there is a, there is a project like this, no? There, there is, Frank. Um, uh, we have a, a competition right now going on that's considering two exoplanet missions, one out of MIT called TASS, or Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which would do exactly what you just described, and that is conduct an all-sky survey looking for Earths and super-Earths orbiting the closest and brightest stars. Now, that mission uh, will only continuously observe for one year a, a small fraction of the sky, but it's still about four or 500 square degrees, um, which is about four or five times larger than the Kepler field of view. But we know from Kepler that if you find one planet transiting its star, chances are that there are other planets orbiting that star. So regardless of whether TESS actually produces Earth's in the habitable zone of these stars, uh, you'll find really good candidates for uh, direct imaging missions um, that are in the works or ongoing. And uh, James Webb Space Telescope then would be perfectly positioned to do characterization of atmospheres of many of these planets. So, um, so that's very exciting. We're going to hear in April. We expect whether or not TESS is turned on to, to go. Um, the other mission in competition is called Finesse. It's an exoplanet characterization mission, basically an infrared spectrometer that would be in low Earth orbit. I think it's a very exciting mission. Um, I'm a little bit biased. I'm on the test team. I think that we really should choose both. We should launch and fly tests first, and then um, and then we should launch and fly something with the capabilities of uh, finesse. 
are we talking about a mission which costs billion of dollars, or are we talking about something which is the order of hundred million dollars? Well, uh, these are both Explore class missions which have a two hundred million dollar cost cap. So, for comparison, Kepler uh, is a Discovery class mission and began life as a three hundred million dollar project, uh, but because of programmatic changes and other other things that happened, uh, we're now uh, a little over six hundred million dollars. So, it's about uh, tests would be about a third the cost of Kepler. Okay. And we would launch in 2017. 2017. Okay. Right. So in 2017, when we will be watching the sky, we will see stars nearby us, a bright star, and we'll be able to say, oh, there is an exoplanet there, right? Yes, we will. And that will be extremely exciting. And that will change totally the perception of our uh, close environment. John, there's a question uh, regarding KLI 172.5. O2. Okay. Uh, it says at one and a half times the size of Earth, rotating around a similar star. How similar is this planet to Earth? How old is the solar system, and is this the perfect candidate for life? Um, we don't know much about this planet yet. Uh, the the size of the planet is um, has a large error bar on it, so it could be say 1.8 Earth radii. It, most likely will be turn out to be a little bit larger. That's simply how these things tend to go with uh, with our understanding of the stellar parameters. Um, in some cases, we get surprised the other way. So KRI 961, we thought was uh, we thought these were very large planets, but it turned out that we thought that the star was much larger than it really was. And it turned out that some of these planets really were not Jupiter sized; they were actually Mars sized. So, but almost all the time, though, it, unless we're talking about the very cool M dwarfs in our sample. The, the sizes of the planets tend to, in the end, come out a little bit larger than what we think from the pipeline results. Um, so given how much larger it is compared to Earth, um, it's not, and the fact that its equilibrium temperature is 283 degrees and likely to go up a little bit, um, it's probably not the perfect place to look for light. And also observationally, it's 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 far away and it's, it's dim. But it, it shows that we're making progress uh, with Kepler towards finding a uh, true Earth analog. And so that's one of the things that makes it so very exciting. Okay, cool. Um, I guess we're, we're about to wrap up here, right, Frank? Yes. Yeah, um, so maybe as a final question for both of you, uh, both Paul and, and John, you guys can tell us, uh, you know, this field of exoplanets has seen tremendous growth in the last 20 years. It's, I know that it's very exciting for our readers whenever I write about it, um, and it's clearly exciting for astronomers. So what, for each of you personally, you know, what excites you the most about studying exoplanets? Uh, and maybe, Paul, you want to start? Oh, well, I'm, I'm a little biased towards my specific technique of, of imaging these planets. So just the quick, the quick answer, Personally, I think Formal Hot now could be one of those planetary systems where we detect all the planets in the system. So we we start learning about a system, about planetary science by detecting another planetary system to the same detail as our own solar system, which is somewhat different from the Kepler approach, which is to gather statistics on many stars. So I'm personally excited, maybe over the next two decades, that we would have discovered all the planets in a single system. Cool. <laughs> John? Well, I think what excites me the most about exoplanet science is the, the breadth and diversity of the discoveries and um, the emerging architecture and hierarchy of the systems that we're discovering. I'm also very excited by the different approaches to detecting exoplanets and how successful they've proven to be. And so I, I think the direct imaging is extremely exciting and that put together the, the whole exoplanet field is just rapidly uh, rapidly progressing and we're learning so much. So I think the speed of discoveries and the speed of the knowledge increase is very exciting. And uh, Frank, you, you want to throw your own thoughts? Well, my thought about this is I think it's important to, as I say, a mission like this should be the next priority for NASA. I'm, uh, I'm very maybe biased. I'm not involved in the mission, but uh, having something which is capable of imaging, detecting exoplanets nearby us should be the priority. The reason for, for which I say that, bluntly like this, is because 
This new telescope we are building, with ad equipped with adaptive optic systems like uh, the TMT, the 30 meter telescope, and um, the EELT, the European Extremely Large Telescope in Chile, they will have the capability to also image those exoplanets if they're close to uh, if they're close to us. So, as Paul shown, have shown, being capable of Imaging an exoplanet brings you a lot of information because you get the color, you get the temperature, you get the orbit as well, and generally you have more surprises than you expected. So we bring an understanding of the formation of the, the stellar system and also the formation of our own solar system. And ultimately detecting a biosignature around one of those nearby uh, stars will be definitely the I mean, the grade of, uh, of uh, the research in astronomy, or modern astronomy so far. Yeah. Cool. OK, well, we're going to hand this uh, hangout. It was supposed to be a 30-minute hangout, and it ended up being a <laughs> one-hour one. I'm sorry for that. But I would like to thank again our speakers and Adam for taking the time to, uh, to, talk, uh, to talk to us about these remarkable results. Um, and I would like to remind our viewers that uh, this Hangout is part of the campaign called the Communicate campaign. So we are trying to get the public excited to what we're doing here at the SETI Institute. And there is a lot of ways you can contribute to this, uh, to help the SETI Institute. You could join our, simply join our Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus pages and participate to the conversation. Uh, we post on a regular basis news about what's going on in astrobiology, in astronomy in general, and also in space exploration. And also, you could visit our website at city.org and uh, participate to our campaign called citystar.org. And I would like to hand this thing out again. Thank you, all of you, for your interest and for your time. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Bye. Thank you.